church camp this week, and uh, I've been able to go the last couple of nights. It's really, really been good. Our children are really, um, I believe, excelling. They have lots of competition and uh, more than just fun and games. Uh, they have Preacher Boys tomorrow. Uh, they've had various uh, singing contests, and all of our kids are involved in that. Uh, as a matter of fact, a couple of our young ladies uh, got up last night, and I didn't even realize that Sierra could play the guitar, and she played the guitar, and her and Brooklyn uh, sang together, and, uh, and of course, it's just been really, really good uh, just for the kids to be willing to participate is a real blessing. One thing about our kids, they're not shy. Uh, they've been standing up here singing for so long uh, that getting up in front of a crowd to them is not that big a deal, and so they've been um, they've been participating and i'm sure grateful for that we're going to pick up tonight now i will go ahead and say this that clay and jameson are way ahead of me when it comes to what they passed out i hand wrote mine um and and so if i'd had time i would have typed it but it would have taken about two days and i didn't have that much time and so um I wrote it down. I don't think there's but maybe one or two uh, errors, and I will try to note them if, we get, if I pay attention to them. Um, but what we've been doing this summer, as you know, is covering some of the questions that you ask as you wrote on the little cards and gave to us. Um, in the meantime, since we've started that, uh, some of these questions are questions that I consider to be uh, may be very common and rather simple, but very concerning to us. And so I'm going to cover the, some of those tonight and uh, let the other guys cover the more difficult ones. I think they've been doing a great job. And so I'm going to leave some of that to them. It's good for them uh, to study and to do that. So some of the things we're going to cover tonight are just common questions, but yet they are very concerning um, and there is scripture to give answer, and that's the main point uh, that I want to get across tonight is whatever the question is, we know that the answer is in the scripture, either in print or in principle. And that's easy to remember, either in print or principle, God has the answer. So to that, I want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 and read the uh, kind of the theme verse for our Wednesday night program, especially for the Awana uh, program. And um, I pray that this is something that all of us will take to heart. And every word in this verse is so very important. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That verse is so deep, and yet it is, I guess you could say, um, in contrast, it's, it's simple, but yet it is very deep. Because if we will study the word of God, we will be able to rightly discern truth. Because the only real truth we have in this world is the Word of God. And I think that you all know that. Um, we don't even know, based on what's happened in the last few years in our culture, um, even history is being questioned as to whether or not what we learned when we were in school was really accurate or not. Now, of course, we know that generally speaking, history 50 years ago that was taught to us was accurate. And what we have now is revised history, uh, attempting to take God out of everything. But you do understand that that question is looming out there, what is truth? And the Bible is the only truth that we really have. And so we are to study it so that we can rightly discern truth. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for all you do for us, the joy that we have in Jesus. Father, I just pray that you would guide our time tonight, and Lord, that what we say and what we do would bring glory and honor to you. Lord, be with our kids and the adults, the sponsors at camp, and I pray, God, that you would just uh, keep them under the shelter of your wing, and they would represent us well, and most of all, that they represent you, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You can be seated. I might add, um, of all the churches that are represented at the church camp, 
uh, our group is most definitely the largest numerically and uh, they can flat make a racket I'll tell you it is uh, uh, it's kind of in an, a gymnasium and uh, you can imagine the sound uh, but it has been really really good so continue to pray for them before we get into this uh, if you have not received the information over your prayer chain um, brother Lonnie um, Hartline uh, passed away and uh, that service is going to be here Saturday at 11 um, burial will be in Eufaula and then after the burial we will come back to the church and have a meal here for the family uh, I think Miss Pat's on the kitchen committee and you ladies know what you need to do um, but we will be feeding that family and they estimate there'll be 25 to 30 in that family so uh, that will be 11 o'clock on Saturday guys the heart lines have not been with us for a while when COVID hit uh, they had COVID over and over um, and there were some just extenuating circumstances with that family uh, but they've been faithful here for many years and so um, I would encourage you to um, uh, try to be here on Saturday uh, it'll just take a, a little bit of time out of your schedule but it will be a blessing uh, if you guys could be here okay Sunday morning um, I, I preached what I consider to be probably the most encouraging message that God's let me preach in a long time and that is God is still in control but over the last six or eight months especially I can't even count the number of times that people in sincerity have asked me what's going on in America and do you believe that there's still hope for America now we have to realize that America is not the only nation in the world but we do also have to realize that America was founded on basic Bible principles. I think that we've covered that sufficient uh, through the years here so we know that and so the question is there hope for America and is revival um, in America like the great awakenings that have taken place through the years uh, is revival uh, still possible now I've written down some scripture but uh, without reading the scripture first give me some answers do you think um, there's hope for America and is there is revival still possible uh, give me an answer and tell me why you think that Jeff okay alrighty as long as there's a God in heaven it's possible somebody else we're gonna go Chet go ahead idolatry Okay. Okay. So we have an example in Scripture where God was long suffering, um, and uh, especially with the people of Israel. When I read uh, stories about the Exodus, and there's a lot of that written in the Psalms as well, you do stop for a moment and think there is hope for America. I mean, look at Israel and all of the things that they did to literally just slap in the face of God and yet God delivered them just as he promised he would okay somebody else is there hope uh, yes ma'am uh -huh. okay very good and the scriptures that I wrote down basically is going to is going to cover that somebody else what's your thoughts about that brother Jerry right okay are you making any reference to short sermons <laughs> I, was just, I was just kind of rightly dividing the word of truth there <laughs> but is that not true Jonah said yet 40 days 
and Nineveh shall be destroyed. Wow. And, um, but God saved the remnant, didn't he? Praise the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Praise the Lord. Jimmy? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And that's one of the scriptures that we'll touch. If, and we're all familiar with that, if my people. Uh, anybody else? Jameson? Right. Uh huh. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Let me get Chet first. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They had been contaminated. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, and again, I'm going to touch on that because the church is made up of individual people. And if we really want to see God do something, the more people that we're able to share the gospel with and win to Christ, the greater, the, literally, the greater the odds are for those of us who are believers. And we'll talk about that uh, in just a bit. All the things that you've given me so far are biblical illustrations, primarily Old Testament illustrations of where God forgave and forgave and forgave. He was long-suffering. He was forbearing. Um, what might, what, is there a difference in then and now? Now, I know that's a, you, I want you to think about that. To whom much is given, much is required. So, is there a difference in God's patience and long-suffering with the people of Israel and the people in the Old Testament, not verses, but in compared to America today? If you could compare. Somebody give me a thought. What's the difference? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. No, no, and you know the rule on Wednesday nights is you can't ask a question unless you know the answer. 
Okay, that's the rule. Um, now I want you to think about the question though. Where we are in time, to whom much is given, much is required. Zach? Okay. Okay. Well, here's the thing. The Bible says that God never changes. Okay. He is He is the rock. He's a fortress. And so God never changes. Did you have your hand up? Okay. Um, and so... But, it, but it's important, I think it's important in a very relevant question. That's right. And once again, you'll notice that I wrote down that the church is made up of people. It's not a building. And we'll get into that. Um, go ahead. I think about in life, you know, particularly like a Christmas time. Sometimes Christmas uh, candles are lit. Mm-hmm. And what happens when the Christmas Okay. We're always going to have evil, God said. That's right. Mm-hmm. You know, but we're always going to have God. Amen. That's and right. That's what you lean on. Okay. All right. So, guys, let me, we're going to move off of this, but I, I do want to look at the scripture here. But I want you to think about the question that I ask. We see all this, the examples in scripture that all of you have shared where God forgave an obstinate, stiff-necked, consistently rebellious people. But Brother Jerry mentioned Jonah, but a few months ago I, I expanded that a little bit and took you to the book of Nahum. And a short time after Nineveh repented and God forgave them, Nineveh reverted back to just like it was before the days of Noah, and God destroyed them. Okay, that time he wiped them out, the city of Nineveh. So this is not a fear factor. I'm just simply saying that there is a time. There is a time when... I do believe that God draws a line. And we're going to look at that. Uh, we'll look at it. We will get to it tonight, but we will look at it in Scripture that I believe there's a time that God draws a line and says enough is enough. And even though, even though God is long-suffering and forbearing with us, the judgment of God will not wait forever. And so I do believe that we are in a little bit different time now and the things that we see going on today are so blatantly in the face of God that, that I, I just believe that literally the wrath of God is being held back today because of his deep love for us and that he wants one more person to be saved. He wants one more person to, to be born into the kingdom just one more person, and you might say one more. Which one? Well, one, one more. Just, but the wrath of God, I believe, is being held back by the mercy and the grace of God. Is there hope for America? The answer to both these questions is yes. Proverbs fourteen thirty four says, "Righteousness exalteth a nation, 
but sin is a reproach to any people. And so we know that if we as a, as a nation could repent and get right with God and once again be called holy, once again be called righteous, that then God, we would find favor with God. In Psalms 33, 12, the Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We quote that very quickly, but we need to stop and think about what that says. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And so do we, do we as a nation claim God as the Lord over us or do we reject it? Like Psalms chapter 2 where the Bible says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine such a vain things? The, the kings of the earth set themselves against the Lord and against the Lord's anointed. And so there is the possibility of revival and, and, um, and maybe uh, better times for America. Several of you mentioned Second Chronicles 7.14. You all know that by heart. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. And then I just made a note. America's hope and the possibility of revival is revealed in these and many other scriptures. Guys, there's things going on that you cannot do a single thing about. There's things going on that I can't do anything about. I'm talking about in the literal sense, but in the spiritual sense, I can pray. I can pray for my nation. Uh, in your quiet time, read Daniel chapter 9, Ezra chapter 9, and Nehemiah chapter 9, and in all three of those chapters, you will see a prayer that was prayed that where Daniel, Nehemiah, and Ezra prayed for the repentance of a nation. Now, you may look at that and say, well, those were just personal prayers. No, you read it. They were praying prayers of repentance for the entire nation. Uh, there wasn't any evidence that any of those three had committed any great transgressions against God. They were literally praying a national, uh, they were praying a prayer asking God to forgive the nation. And that's what you and I can do. That should be our part if my people, which are called by my name. So I want to encourage you that way. And guys, as I preached on Sunday morning, there is uh, that God is still in control um, I, I, I mean what I said Sunday morning. I believe that we're in one of the most opportune times to share Christ with people because so many people are struggling. So many people are afraid. Um, you know, people are watching the money market. You know, they're watching. And guys, listen, um, if that's all we've got to trust in, we've missed the mark somewhere. And so I'm not saying it's not important, but I'm just saying that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness and not on anything in this world. And so, as Christians, we need to pray. And then, what is necessary for us to see a strong and stable church emerge from the current chaos uh, that's going on around us? Okay? Now, th this makes it a little more personal because I'm talking about a church but not necessarily individual churches, but the church at large, but yet the church at large is made up of individual churches. And uh, so I want to just, I think this is a very relevant question. As a matter of fact, someone wrote this down and handed it to me just recently and it didn't use just exactly these words, but basically this is the question they ask, that in a world that is spiritually declining, What's necessary for a church to emerge strong and stable with all that's going on in our culture today? So before we get to these scriptures, somebody give me an answer. What is necessary for a church to emerge strong and stable in this present quagmire that we've got going on? Go ahead. Okay, all righty. Focus on and adhere to the Word of God. We, we can give you a ton of scripture that basically tell us that. Okay. Okay. All righty. Uh, each individual. Uh, it, we need to make it our priority 
to be as close to the Lord as we possibly can? How do we arrive there? Through prayer and the study of the Word of God. Okay? Uh, somebody else, what's your thoughts about um, Jameson? Okay. 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 So we need to do what the scripture says when it says we need to get into the meat of the word of God, not just the milk, but the meat of the word of God. Miss Dan? Mm-hmm. That's right. Right. You know, years ago, before I was a pastor, I went to a evangelism conference with my pastor. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget this. I heard um, Johnny Bassanio, and he was the pastor of the S Second Baptist Church in Houston, I believe. Am I right? That's what they called it, Second Baptist Church. Because uh, the First Baptist Church was pastored by Ed Young. And so, um, but he made this statement at an evangelism conference. He said, we need to stop being so church-minded and become kingdom-minded. And boy, that kind of that set me back. And I, I got to thinking, but the kingdom is made up of churches. And what, the point he was making was just what Miss Deb said. Many churches become so turned inward that all of our ministry is inward. It's not reaching out. In other words, I'll be happy to help you, and I'll be happy to help you, and I'll be happy to teach a Bible study to you and you. And, but if a church is turned inward, and our only ministry is within these, the confines of these walls, then we're not doing the Great Commission. And so we have to go out, and so... What is necessary for us to see a strong, stable church emerge from this current chaos? Matthew 16, verse 16 through 18. Uh, just go ahead and turn there. I, I, I just wrote down a part of some of these verses uh, because most of you know these verses anyway. Um, in Matthew 16 and uh, verse number 16, the Bible says this, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that uh, thou art Peter, and upon this rock. Now let me stop right there. He wasn't talking about Peter the rock. He was talking about Peter's confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We need to make sure we understand that. He said, upon that I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So is it possible for a strong, stable church to emerge from all the things that are going on? Yes, but Jesus Christ has to be the foundation. 
in 1 Corinthians 3.11, the Bible says, For other foundation, um, um, as a matter of fact, if you don't mind, I lost a few words there. Go to 1 Corinthians 3.11, and um, I just had a senior moment there. He says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is in Jesus Christ. So I think one of the, not one of, but probably the primary thing that has to happen in a church for that church to literally emerge strong and stable is the very fact that Jesus Christ has to be the foundation of that church. Now, people would say, well, that's kind of elementary. I mean, why would anybody establish a church or why would anybody have a church where Jesus Christ was not the foundation of the church? But could I encourage you just to look around today I have, a, I have a newspaper laying on my desk. I've shown it to some of you, Ben. A newspaper, it was uh, last week's publication uh, of the Beacon. It's a Christian newspaper out of Tulsa. Um, and um, the, the attorney that was killed in a wreck, uh, Gil Stadley, had subscribed that for me. And um, so I didn't even know it existed. Uh, and uh, so I get that every couple of weeks. But on the front page of that newspaper, and I've got it on my desk, it shows a marquee of one of the, one of the largest churches in Tulsa, a marquee congratulating and encouraging the Pride Parade in Tulsa. And they opened their church for, to give them refreshments and get in out of the heat and such as that. And I just simply say this to that Jesus Christ cannot be the foundation to that kind of a, of a church and I would even say church tongue in cheek because they may be having an assembly there they may be meeting there but Jesus Christ is not the foundation of that gathering or there would not be that kind of conduct coming from the leadership of that church okay so churches are emerging but the churches we see emerging are churches that are so liberal and Jameson hit a, a real note while ago when he said we've got to get down to the meat we've got to get down to the depth of Scripture and know what God says I thought Clay did a really good job covering that issue the other day that particular issue uh, but it can be covered with the Word of God. So let me give you another. Um, the, the church will never be any stronger than its people. That has already been stated right here. Romans 6.1, I'm not going to read all this. You'll be familiar. But Romans 6.1 says, and he's speaking to believers. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And so, what's, poss what, what's necessary for a church to emerge from this chaotic situation we're in and be strong and stable and make a difference? And one of them is for us to understand that that command for us not to just flippantly sin as if God didn't even care. As a matter of fact, Go to Romans, and let me just touch on part of what's, what I didn't write down. He goes on in uh, chapter 6. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, and like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should walk in newness of life. The Bible goes in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. When I read that, the old man is crucified with him. What verse do you think about? Somebody give me a What do you think about when it says the old man was crucified with him? Galatians 2.20. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Let's think about this. What's necessary for the church to emerge from this chaotic culture that we're in and to emerge strong and stable and and make a difference the scripture 
as we think about what Paul said in conjunction with what we see written in Romans, he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love that passage because what it's literally saying is that Paul had to die. I am crucified with Christ. So Paul died, if you will, but he was alive in Christ. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so there has to be some dying going on, and we have to do the things that God has told us to do. I love this passage. If you go right on over to verse number 12, now he's talking to believers. I, I, I just wonder what a church would really look like if we just took this chapter and made it our theme. He's talking to believers, verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye yourselves members as instruments of unrighteousness. Did you get that, of unrighteousness? The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. So he's saying that we need to come out from the unrighteous lifestyle. He goes on and says, But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion over. Now, just a quick question. What does that mean? Can I pick out a volunteer? What does it mean when it says sin shall not have dominion? We're talking to Christians. Darlene? When you what? Okay. All righty. Okay, all righty. And, and, but the Bible says to that, sin should not have that dominion over us. Go ahead. Okay. In other words, it shouldn't be the pattern. We're, all of us are going to commit sin, sadly enough. But when the Bible says sin shall not have dominion over us, that doesn't mean that we're going to be sinlessly perfect. What it does say is that the grace of God is sufficient in our lives that we should not let sin take root in our life and become the pattern of our lives. Sin has no dominion over a child of God. Go ahead. Okay. All righty. Okay. And praise the Lord, God is long-suffering, and He. But nonetheless, that should not be the attitude of our heart. Uh -huh. Because we want to be like them. Okay. And, and so even though we do fall short mm -hmm. of repenting, it won't happen like on purpose. Okay. All right, very good. Because the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, therefore all things have become new. Now, we're not going to get into this real deep right now because we're going to come back to this at a later time. But there's this... There's this question, uh, and I could use names I want, but how long can a person that professes to be a Christian, how long can they live in the same sin, in the same sin, in the same sin until, they, until God says that's enough? And I want you to think about it. I don't even want you to try to answer that. But I've dealt with that. I've dealt with that in our family. Dealt with that in this church, especially because of the number of years we've been here. And I, and I think it's a, I think it's a valid question. Did you know that many times we presume upon the grace of God? You might say, "Well, are you diminishing the power of God's grace?" No. I'm not diminishing the power of God's grace. Did you know that there are several places in Scripture 
where a person has sinned, developed a pattern, and sinned and sinned and sinned. You find that in Rome in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And they've just sinned and sinned and sinned until, until finally the scripture says, and God turn them over to Satan so that their flesh would be destroyed, but their soul would be saved. Okay, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I'm just telling you, there's a point that we must not presume upon the grace of God because, in, especially in the Old Testament, you see where people, they would just do it and do it and do it and do it, and finally God said, that's enough. We see the same in the New Testament. If you look at Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, I, they were part of the church. As a matter of fact, when you read that story, let me add something to that story that I've never, I don't think I've ever mentioned it before, but it hit me this week as I was doing some reading. Um, Ananias and Sapphira were part of the church, but I do not believe that that particular act was the first time they had rebelled against God. I just, I just, I don't believe that was the first time they had ever ignored what God said to them. I, I just believe that we see the consistency of God's long suffering and forbearing and and grace extended. And so, at that particular time, it appears like. Ananias and Sapphira were these model Christians. You know, he, he might have even been an a elder, a deacon in the church, and I'm sure she was whatever in the church. And it appears like that they committed that one sin and God zapped them. And I'm not saying that's not the case, but I believe based on a lot of, if you look at consistency in Scripture, I believe that God knew their heart and God knew that there was many other times that they had probably violated the word of God. So let me just back up to that question. What's necessary? It's necessary is for people, individuals like you and me to get our hearts right with God and not to be focused on everybody else, but get our hearts right with God. And in doing so, the church will emerge. Romans 12, 1 and 2, we've quoted it hundreds of times. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you know what we should see every time we walk into this church facility? We should see something that looks totally different from what we walked out of. We should see something totally different than the world that we have to live in. We should be able to walk into the sanctuary of God and the spirit be different. People's attitudes be different. People's apparel be different. That's what a strong, stable church should be. The scripture also teaches us that the word of God, the Bible, must be preached. 1 Corinthians 1.21, the Bible says that people are led to the Lord by the foolishness of preaching. 2 Timothy 4, Paul admonished or encouraged Timothy to preach the word, be instant in season and out, just to preach the word. We'll cover the next question here with what time we have this is a really, some of you are going, that's a dumb question. But read it. Does God still answer prayer as he did in Bible times? Elijah cried out to God and God sent fire from heaven. The sick were healed, the lame were made to walk, the dead were raised. So, Elisha prayed, Lord, opened the eyes of my servant so that he could see, and immediately the servant saw something different because God opened his eyes. So, does God answer prayers? Does he still answer prayers as he did in Old Testament times? Okay. 
why don't we see why don't we see the miracle the miracles that we saw in the Old Testament why do we rarely see those things today now we see miracles don't get me wrong Every time I see a little toy running out across the ranch or riding the horn, I'm going, wow, what a miracle. Last night she was up singing. I'm going, oh, I couldn't help but crying. We've seen miracles. God's given us miracles. Jimmy. Okay. 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 Alrighty. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. So th that's a great answer. Th there is there is a difference in the fact that we have the written, finished word of God in our hand. But that also backs up and maybe lends a little bit of light to the other question that we asked earlier about the difference in the judgment of God or the deliverance of God on a nation, Israel, as compared to America. We've got, we've got the word of God right in our presence. Uh, I don't know any home that doesn't have a, a Bible in it. Well, I'll take that back. We just met a young man the other day uh, that lives right here that had no Bible in their home. He had no clue what the Bible said about anything. It was absolutely amazing. Praise God, he's at church camp this week. I'm trusting the Lord he'll get saved. But, but does God answer prayer the way he did then? And once again, all of us could probably back up somewhere and say, I believe that God, I believe that what God did was nothing short of miraculous a chip okay okay but once again the nation just like the church is made of individuals and if we as individuals We'll humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. There's still hope for America. Now, let me, let me just do this to, to try to get through this. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will open. Somebody said a while ago, we don't ask. We don't ask for big things. We ask for little things. I mentioned one time, not to make light of any prayer, but if you lose your car keys, it's okay to pray that God would help you find your car keys. But they're right where you left them. And you could probably backtrack and find your car keys. It's easy to ask God for something small. But sometimes we're afraid to ask God for the big thing. So my, my, my word would be this. Don't neglect to ask God for the small things. But don't be afraid to ask God for the big things. Ms. Mayo. <laughs> oh, you're in that club too, are you? <laughs> okay, I. Okay. Okay. 
So we ask God for something, but then he don't, he's not moving as fast as so we're, we try to help him, okay? Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She said, "If I could just touch the hill in his garden, I was reading about when Jesus healed the the was it the centurion's son when he said, i 'I've not seen such faith as that in all of Israel,' because when the man made the appeal for Jesus to heal his son, um, he said, you don't even have to come to my house. All you've got to do is speak the word. And Jesus responded to that. And so um, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing, Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. And you can read the rest of that. And we've just got a minute. Number four is obvious but I thought it was neat to write it down because the other day I had two people come up to me the same day and said, do you really believe Jesus is coming soon? And I know the reason, and, and it blessed me because I got to give an answer, but it was one was asked to me in sincerity and the other asked it almost in a condescending way um, do you really I mean come on I mean come on See, there's a difference in the way you ask the question and so all I have to allude to is what the scripture says and in John 14 Jesus said let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions Pastor Clay preached on that subject. It's been several years ago now, and I love the he he made a statement, and it probably wasn't original, but he said there are no vacant mansions in heaven. No vacant mansions in heaven. If he's gone to build one for you, you will one day occupy that place. There's no vacancies in heaven. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. First Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 4 says, and again, this is one of those verses that most of us have heard. He says, with the sound of a trumpet, the Lord's going to descend and take us to be with him, and we will forever be with him. And then I like Acts chapter 1. I think these guys in Acts chapter 1 had a lot in common with some of us. If you'll turn over to Acts chapter 1 and look at verse number 10, I'll close with this. These men who had spent so much time with Jesus were at the very least apprehensive about his return. And so I love this because what it tells me is that God is truly concerned about how we see, how we look at the fact of his coming again. Because it was so important, the Bible says, and while they, talking about those men, look steadfastly, uh, look, look steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, as he ascended, behold, Two men stood by them in white rain, uh, in white apparel, and I think that we could certainly uh, agree that those two men were the angels of the Lord, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? How many of you have ever talked to somebody and they were just gazing? Like, hello? I mean, these guys had walked with Christ. They had all these promises. They had seen all these things. And he ascended, and they're going. I mean, maybe not exactly with that look. But maybe, especially with what was said, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? 
This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So the question is, is Jesus really coming soon? I guess you'd have to define soon. But we're in the last days. And these questions are important. I so appreciate those of you that wrote some of these questions down. They may sound simple. But if you need an answer to those questions, they're important. And so I appreciate these questions that have been asked, and I hope that maybe in some small way we've covered some of that this evening. How many of y'all know that God is still in control? I got to tell you what happened Sunday right after church. I was so excited. You know, we ought to pray that God would give us opportunity to witness to somebody. But if you pray that away, then be prepared to witness to somebody because God will you know, um, through the years, one of the things that some of the young people at our church have just kind of been frustrated at me about is that somehow, in God's sovereignty, um, God always reveals, or not always, God many times reveals to me what our young people are doing on their electronic devices. I mean, I intercept texts. I've actually shown some of those things to you guys. I mean, I intercept texts and things like that. And uh, But anyway, Sunday morning, right after morning service, I had Eli Knight's phone number in my phone, and, um, and I had texted some of the young people that saying, I just try to encourage. I can't do all of them every week, but I just try to encourage them. And so I had texted a couple of the young people, and Eli happened to be one of them. And uh, right after I texted him and just said, I appreciate your faithfulness and, you know, just that kind of thing, almost immediately my phone rang. And I looked, and it said Eli Knight. So I was expecting Eli Knight on the end of the phone. I said, hello, and he goes, who is this? And I'm going, hmm, I apparently did not have Eli Knight's phone number correct. And this, this, I could tell it was a young man. He said, who is this? And I said, this is Pastor Turner out at Lindsay Chapel. And the phone just got quiet. <laughs> but it was good. He said, I don't think this was an accident. He said, my name's not Eli, but it's Levi. And you were encouraging this young man because he was singing and he said, I go to a church in Shakota, and God has gifted me. I can play the guitar and sing, but I've never wanted to do it in church. And said, my grandmother who raised me has been encouraging me to sing. And then I text this text. It said, thank you for your faithfulness to God and your willingness to sing. And he goes, I really don't think that was an accident, do you? And I go, my God is still in control. <laughs> he controls the airwaves. Let's all stand. You know what I told that young man? I said, sing, brother, sing. <laughs> uh -oh. Don't forget, funeral, 11 o'clock Saturday at the church. Brother Lonnie, that family would really covet your prayers. Please lift them up to the Lord. And um, I know that most of you will do your best to be here. Continue to pray for our kids in camp, and it'll be a blessing if you'll do that. Brother Billy Jones, most of y'all know he's having some really serious heart issues right now um, and continues to uh, cover our prayers. Don't forget to pray for him. And Brother Ed Phillips, he is doing a little bit better, uh, but continue to pray uh, for Brother Ed. And with that said, Jameson, would you dismiss us?